Welcome to the Unity for Humanity panel discussion on the hospital of the future. My name is Nick Facey, and I have the privilege of being your moderator today. I'm a senior program manager at Unity Solutions, and I've previously served as the chief of staff to the Minister of Health in the province of British Columbia. I'm excited to become more informed on what innovations are happening in the healthcare space with this group. I'm joined by three incredible thought leaders. First, Mel Melanie Lowther, the director of innovation at Texas Children's Hospital. She joined Texas Children's Hospital in 2008 in the healthcare engineering department. In various leadership roles since, she spent her time designing strategy and guiding work to ensure a lasting impact on the lives of TCH patients and their families. She currently serves as the Director of Entrepreneurship and Innovation with responsibility for intelligent process automation, e-health telemedicine uh, in the Texas Children's system. In 13 years at Texas Children's, she's become particularly mindful to the intersection of people, process, and technology. With a background in process engineering and trained, at, trained as a master black belt in Lean Six Sigma, Melanie is the point person for innovation work at Texas Children's Hospital. Thanks for joining us, Melanie. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure being here. Next up, we have Dr. Mike Wesolowski, the CEO of Luxonic. Uh, he's over a decade of experience leading high-performing teams in science, innovation, and technology development. He's an entrepreneur and a multidisciplinary researcher and a passionate advocate for the concept of using tech for good. Obviously belongs in this panel with that. The purpose of the goal of Luxonic is to empower the healthcare industry by providing affordable, easily distributed and immersive tools that improve medical education, hands-on training and virtual healthcare delivery. In 2020, Luxonic was named one of the top 20 most innovative early stage companies in Canada by the Canadian Innovation Exchange. Easy for me to see. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Happy to be here. And last but not least is Professor John McGee, Scientica Associate Professor, Director of the 3D Visual Aesthetics Lab Faculty of Arts, Design, and Architecture at the University of New South Wales. As an associate professor, John McGee is the director of the 3D Visualization Lab. His research explores art-led, design-led modes of visualizing complex scientific and biomedical data. His research investigates the application of creative practice, technical innovation, and immersive platforms to new data visualization challenges. Areas of research include virtual world design, scientific discovery, education and engagement in the biomedical communication and clinical intersection. This is accumulated in John being recognized as one of the UNSW Australia's 21 rising stars in research leadership. Thanks for joining us, John. Thank you. Great to be here. So it's obvious that, you know, I'm surrounded by a bunch of people smarter than me, so don't want to spend too much time talking. I'm going to kick us off with a, with a question. John, it's going to go to you to start us off. How has COVID changed the healthcare and hospital landscape from your experience? Um, I think there's a couple of things that have affected me directly in the work that I do. I think it's brought into sharp focus using technologies to proxy human interaction. So how can we um, use things like virtual reality and, and digital technologies to supplement when you can't physically be in contact with someone due to COVID restrictions? So that's the first thing. And it's it's shone a light on some of the research I've been doing over the years that's been about that, but I think it's um, it's certainly um, brought more attention to it and um, and people have asked more questions on how we might implement it clinically because they've often been pure research projects at that point. Um, the second thing is is really, um, you know, COVID has inhibited our ability to, to test some of these technologies. And many of our studies because of hygiene um, and protocol issues have been put on hold um, so we were, we're currently doing a random control trial of um, a tool which helps uh, patients manage their pain um, using virtual reality and, and training a little avatar dog um, and taking them on various trials. And just because of the protocols and, and, and restrictions of COVID, that's really hampered our ability to test that stuff. So it's a sort of double-edged sword, um, but it's certainly um, bringing into focus and allowing us to, to really showcase how immersion and interaction using digital technologies could actually replace or, or, or supplement um, human contact, which is unable to be done because of COVID. Hey John, that's a really interesting point. Uh, you know, you said the double-edged sword of uh, COVID. I, I've seen it myself that there's some, some really new drivers to solutions that real-time 3D can be a solution for that COVID has made you know, more needed. And at the same time, there's all the the downsides of try, still trying to get work done and still trying to work together, or in your case, uh, run research labs in the COVID environment. Yes. You know, if I could add to that, I think that from a user perspective, 
we've kind of built in now because of COVID, a, like a forced familiarity with technology that wasn't really there before. And so I feel like the foundation of what is maybe an acceptable norm has really elevated during this time as well. And so it allows us to be, you know, a little more innovative and, and push the envelope a, a bit, a bit more. And awesome, Melanie, is there something at the hospital where you've seen that changing landscape with COVID and technology? Yes, uh, one of the probably best examples of that is with e-health and telemedicine, telehealth in general. Prior to COVID-19, we were really just kind of dabbling in it. It was uh, a couple of select subspecialties. They would see patients who are at rural um, community provider offices, and they would be able to uh, have a telemedicine visit in that manner only. And thanks to um, a couple of different reasons why uh, eHealth, you know, now is just a way that we do business. I think part of that is that families have had to get comfortable with it. You know, you do everything from ordering groceries to school online now. Our providers really jumped in with both feet. And then also the, the regulatory uh, posture has changed quite a bit and has allowed us to expand what we're able to offer with e-health and telemedicine. But had awesome. the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened, we probably would not be where we are today. It would have taken years. So it accelerated some of the adoption of these technologies. Absolutely. Yeah, we've, we've definitely seen the same thing. At Luxonic, you know, the interest level in immersive technologies and their application in healthcare for really creating distributed solutions for a lot of problems that we face in healthcare has has definitely um, has definitely improved during COVID. I think crisis breeds innovation um, in humans, and that's really what we've seen a lot of um, interest and funding go into um, developing and implementing healthcare applications across the board for you know, lots of different technologies um, from teleconsultations to virtual reality. And Mike, how about you expand a little bit on you know, what you've done particularly in driving in, during these COVID days? Yeah, I mean, right away, one of the first things we, you know, when, when COVID first hit, we wanted to help. Um, I think anyone who's in healthcare um, really is focused on using technology for good. Um, all of us want to help patients and, and, and help practitioners if we can. So one of the first things that we did um, is to work with paramedics in the province of Saskatchewan to develop out 360 uh, video training applications for donning and doffing of um, uh, protective equipment and training for how to uh, properly um, secure samples, uh, COVID samples. Um, so that was something we did right away. Um, and then in the background, all of the work that we've been doing over the past several years in um, uh, using immersive technologies for not just training and education, but also for actual healthcare delivery and radiology um, that's, uh, that's picked up quite a bit as well. So COVID disrupted a lot of workflows in healthcare and a lot of radiology workflow actually happens within their office. Um, and they couldn't be in their office. They couldn't be together. And what we've been creating actually over the past several years is a virtual version or a digital analog of that office. And they were, you know, radiologists are able to use that to, um, work in a way collaboratively with their colleagues, that's very similar to doing that in, in the physical world. That's super interesting. And it kind of leads right into my ne next question, Mike. Like, where do you see real-time 3D having the greatest advancement in either care or outcomes? Well, I think the, the, the big power of uh, immersive technologies is the feeling of presence, right? And we lose that a little bit when we're all isolated. Um, being present and being able to collaborate with um, our colleagues in settings that are familiar, but doing it virtually, uh, I think has a has a whole lot of power. Um, and that's 
what you know the other real benefit of this technology is being able to distribute it widely um, and then connect people together. Very cool. Melanie, it, it seems like your experience will lead right into that answer. Where have you seen some, some advancements of care and outcomes? Yeah, you know, I, I think it can go across the board where I see this technology really helping it is when we're talking about getting to the care. Um, at Texas Children's, you know, we, we, while there are always opportunities, we feel like we do patient care really well. Once you're on the operating room table or you're in the clinic visiting with one of our providers, we're exceptional at that. But getting to that care can frequently be riddled with a lot of different barriers. And whether part of that is education or, um, you know, just cumbersome things that that inhibit our, our families getting to the care that they need immediately. I think another avenue that that takes is with all of this extra work, it really contributes to physician and care team burnout, which is um, seen everywhere, you know, especially during the pandemic. And so, you know, I, I think that's the, the direction that we're seeing um, the greatest impact in the advancement of care and outcomes is just by keeping our physicians, our providers, and our care teams in the right headspace so they can provide that care. That, that's awesome. John, I've let you be quiet for too long. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, so this is an area I'm quite passionate about, about trying to um, improve patients' understanding of diagnosis and understanding um, and supporting them in decision-making through visualization. Um, and it's certainly clear, and, and as, as imaging modalities continue to improve, you know, we've got continual increased fidelity of, of various disease processes and diagnosis through radiology, for instance, and those modalities like CT, MRI. Um, but obviously these images are not designed to be shown to patients necessarily. They're for diagnosis or for writing reports for clinical specialists. Um, however, they're often used as props. And I think digital technologies and immersive technologies could potentially support and help them make sense of the patient, make sense of that, um, those images, um, particularly using 3D visualization. Um, and certainly the work that, that we've done um, at St. Vincent's Hospital here in Sydney, in Australia, is looking at um, how we might visualize these in more um, design-led ways um, and using immersive technologies to support them and understand why and what a stroke is and how it's happening using their actual data. But there's an, another aspect to it when you use these digital technologies is also um, building the narrative and the story around how people make sense of that, that data because the raw data itself can become meaningless unless it's built into a narrative. So I think um, you know, immersive technologies, real-time technologies that are available now and more democratized can certainly enhance that interaction and that sense-making of, of people when they make sense of their disease, they make sense of and try to make a decision and then move forward with, with, with the clinical professional. I think that's really well said. Uh, and it, it struck my own memory. I recently broke a bone playing hockey because you know, I'm Canadian. And uh, the doctor showed me on, a, on, a, on the x-ray and he had to point out where the bone was broken on the x-ray to me. And I was like, guess I have to believe him that it's broken there because to me, it doesn't it didn't mean anything at all. Melanie, what have you seen yeah. on that x-ray from the hospital floor? It reminds me of a personal story, but one that any, anyone can really relate to. So at a children's hospital, I think one of the things that sets you apart is uh, the role of a child life specialist. And for those of you that don't know what they are, they are healthcare professionals. They help children and their families, siblings, anyone who's involved with them just kind of navigate that process of illness, injury, disability, trauma, hospitalization, whatever it is. And so how that relates to us, we, my child had to have an MRI a, a little while ago. And I recall going in and trying to explain to my eight-year-old uh, what was going to happen in the MRI. Luckily, we have an amazing group of child life specialists at Texas Children's, and they have a lot of tools available to them to help prepare families for these experiences. And they showed him a video. They had some sounds that he could listen to. He saw pictures, you know, regular 
Polaroid pictures. And I couldn't help but think, gosh, we could do so much more if we had <laughs> real-time 3D imaging, you know, if we could allow him to navigate on his own to see what it would be like to be in the MRI machine and to hear the sounds while he sees what's going on and to really be able to take that exploration into his own hands. So, you know, my personal example, but I think it's relatable, not just with MRIs uh, and certainly not with pediatrics. Anytime we have that opportunity to explore on our own and feel a sense of control improves our outcomes. Yeah, I love that, Melanie. You know, so we, we have John talking about improve the ability to use real-time 3D to improve understanding. Melanie, you're talking about the, you remove the novelty, understand the process of what's going on. And Mike, I think you're about to talk to us about using real-time 3D to enable collaboration, right? Well, yeah, but before that, you know, Melanie, I'm smiling here because we, we actually worked with a child life specialist at the Children's Hospital here um, to build a pediatric MRI uh, simulator for preparation for MRI scans. So exactly that using 360 video um, and being able to go through the exact process from start to finish. And we end off with the, the, the pediatric patient as part of you know, a larger preparation program, but the PED going into the MRI and hearing the sights and sounds, but they, they get prepared for that procedure. And we've, you know, there's been lots of research that shows if we can prepare you know, patients for procedures beforehand, anxiety goes down, patient outcomes can improve. So I think um, that's, uh, it, it's, yeah, I think we all have very similar stories here. Um, and, and I think being able, again, to distribute these technologies widely um, and being able to then you know, couple um, these, our understanding of clinical workflows with um, you know, the collaborative aspect of these technologies, I think has a, a lot of real power, um, especially you know, bridging that gap between the urban and rural divide um, for healthcare. Yeah, which is an incredible challenge. I, I grew up on Northern Vancouver Island. Just having a, enough doctors for the population is a real challenge. Is that an area that you guys three have seen some, some progress in? Melanie, I think you mentioned telehealth. Yes, absolutely. So telehealth, as you can imagine, allows our organization and so many others to really expand their reach into the more rural or lesser populated areas. You know, one thing that we are struggling with, just like schools, is the accessibility of uh, Wi-Fi or other broadband uh, services. And so, you know, we're working diligently with our local legislature as well as high tech companies who can help fill those gaps. Uh, but it's certainly an area that we would love to see shored up so that um, everyone can benefit from the care. And John, have you seen some adoption or some challenges there? Yeah, I mean, just to to add to what's been discussed, I think it's building on what Nick, uh, what Mike was saying around um, the distribution and collaborative component. And I'd say there's another part that's a real buzz just now, which is kind of about building community and interaction using multiplayer experiences. So mm -hmm. how can we bring lots of people around to to talk in a group in immersive technologies around healthcare challenges? And there's a project that we're working on at the moment um, with uh, with young people and, and adolescents looking at how who who receiving um, chemo treatment or um, cancer treatment who have to isolate because they're immunocompromised and they they're using zoom at the moment to interact but we want to explore how we could use multiplayer and um, gaming environments for them to talk and interact and and, and talk to one another and it, it's interesting because this was an issue before covid and now um, this isn't you know, it's been amplified with COVID because um, lots of people are kind of isolated and want to interact. But the, th the third part of that is in a safe place. So how can we interact collectively? They don't want to be in an open world where they're with lots of other people. They want to be with other people that they feel safe with. So how do we design those environments is really, really interesting. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of adjacencies to just how new diagnoses of, of patients, especially with rare rare diagnoses and not having a built-in peer group, you know, not knowing what's going to happen and having the opportunity to interact with people around your same age 
who are going through the same things um, when it feels just completely foreign from um, your regular life. So I love that idea of community. Yeah, that, that's very cool. I, you know, so we've, we've got the, the connecting ability of technology really coming through and the benefits in the healthcare space. Um, where else do you see the innovations coming from? And Melanie, let's start with you. Sure. So I think it's going to come from two places, and those are problems and the people. So, you know, I, I love technology. We're, I'm in innovation. We deal with it all the time. It's super fun, but we really have to start with what problem are we trying to solve? And, you know, healthcare in general has a lot of different problems to solve, whether it's um, the whole care of the patient, not just treating what's right in front of them, but really thinking about behavioral and mental health and how do we care for someone's entire being um, to very customized and, and precise care. We also had an opportunity to host a hackathon a couple of months ago for the hospital of the future. And we had one segment that was specific for our uh, younger than 18 participants. And I was amazed at how many seven, eight, nine-year-olds created videos, animations of what they thought, you know, healthcare of the future would look like. And in every single one of those, they were directing their care. They were, they were part of the care team. I feel like, you know, especially with younger uh, patients, care really happens at them. Uh, you know, the, it's more of the families and their caretakers and the providers talking to each other, making decisions, and then the care happens to them. But in all of these videos, they were active participants and really making decisions for themselves. And so I think, you know, from an external viewpoint, it's talking to our patients, it's talking to their families, understanding their pain points and what problems we can solve for them, and then doing the same internally uh, with our care teams and uh, back of house people who are supporting the organization. You know, how can we prevent burnout and really make their work easier so they can provide the best care possible? Melanie, there must be a couple of clones of you because the, the number of topics that you're able to cover, it's absolutely- <laughs> People know. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, any thoughts on where do you see some innovation in the healthcare space coming from? No, I, I echo Melanie completely there. Um, you know, I think it's critical for us to remember that technology is only good if it's solving a problem. Uh, in many cases, immersive technology is not going to be the solution for a particular problem. Um, and we have to be aware of that and we have to not try to force solutions. Um, I think, you know, innovation from the patient side is fantastic. I think we, to Melanie's other point, really need to support our caregivers and our physicians and all of the people who are working in the healthcare industry. Um, you know, understanding their workflow um, and where their pain points are is, is critical to adoption of any new technology into healthcare. So I think that's where we see a lot of ideas coming from. In fact, when we do, you know, a demo or a pitch session with a radiologist, almost always they have ideas of, oh, we could use this technology for this. This is a problem that I have. And, and here's, you know, how I think this solution could work with it. So, you know, coming from the, the provider, I think that's going to be something that a lot of companies like my own should really pay attention to. Very cool. And, and, and John, you know, from the land down under, where do you think <laughs> some innovation come from? Uh, so, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's something I've thought about a lot, trying to future gaze about where things are going to go. Um, and I suppose my response is very much through the lens of my experience um, and slightly, slightly biased around the design component and how we, um, we, we approach things in a more designly way rather than like um, both Mike and Melanie have said, just technology for technology's sake, looking at the problem, understanding the users and developing elegant solutions that kind of address the stakeholders in an equitable way. I think is the area and I think the way we do that is really and I know this word's used a lot but multidisciplinary approaches to problems 
Um, and we see in industry, I mean, certainly you wouldn't design a video game without designers, without engineers, without um, a whole bunch of people that come in to, 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 to really roll out the product. And I think when we look at problems in healthcare and in hospitals, we need to come in with these groups of teams and hear all the voices in the room when we develop outcomes and not just one voice, which is often the technology voice. Um, and I think, so I think that's where a lot of the real, you know, innovation will come. And I think also this crossover notion where we can look, we've got massive acceleration in, in gaming, um, you know, with the, the metaverse and, and, and lots of other things happening and that are very exciting and will change the way humanity moves in certain areas um, and how we consume. And so I think looking at those areas and looking at technologies that are accelerating and approaches that are accelerating and think, well, actually, how can we use this in health? How can this benefit in health? Um, and bringing some of those people over to get their opinions and their viewpoints and their voices in this roundtable approach. I think that's where the innovation is going to come. So I, I can't put a pin in the map and say it'll come into this particular one area. I think it will be a movement approach with lots of voices. Very, very cool. Well, John, you've actually kind of spurred me onto a third question on here, which is, I think we see somehow, uh, you know, the opportunity that COVID has created uh, for te technology to improve the healthcare delivery against those challenges. There's also the kind of the sometimes considered toxic gaming environment that kids are playing in now. Do you think healthcare could help bring some humanity to this uh, technology enabled interactions? Um, yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think, I think, as I said earlier, I think, um, you know, like many industries, there's positives and there's negatives and there's things that we can take that really can benefit. And it should be a two-way dialogue. So absolutely, I think there's things that we learn in healthcare and, and in our research work that could cross-fertilize gaming. And I think vice versa, there's things that are going on in the gaming industry and the way we design games and, and work with users um, that could benefit. So I think it's just creating more dialogue, um, less silo-based approach. Cool. Mike, what have you seen on that front? Yeah, you know, I, I would say the big power of immersive technologies or one of them is the ability to, to build empathy and equity, right? You know, when you walk, when you can walk in the shoes almost literally of a cancer patient or, you know, a, a pediatric patient or someone, um, you know, who may be disadvantaged, um, I think that can build empathy in people and, you um, that's one way that we could use immersive technologies maybe to, to shift the needle um, away from those toxic environments if, if done properly. I love it. And, and Melanie, you know, at the Children's Hospital, have you, have you seen some of that? Yeah, well, I, I love uh, Mike's answer and building empathy, I think, is just a really important element of, you know, having a, a healthy and functioning community. As far as in pediatric healthcare, you know, gaming, gamification, it's here, it's here. You know, telling kids not to play video games, we're not doing much there. And so I, I think this idea of adopting what works best, as John was saying, and applying it to our world really makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have been investing quite a bit in uh, gaming and gamification, just kind of at the bare minimum, the idea of tracking and rewarding. Um, we're dabbling in, you know, building our own virtual reality video game to improve outcomes. So I, I think there's a lot there. I know we aren't the only ones interested in it. Um, as far as the, the toxic culture, well, I, I think building that empathy and, and bringing up the next group of kiddos so that they can be compassionate humans is kind of our job. Uh, I, I love it, Melanie. And I think that's a, a great positive point to end on. So thanks to our, our three panelists today, uh, really informative discussion. You know, we covered how COVID has kind of changed the healthcare industry. That shift is probably going to remain forever, but we have a, equally on the other side of the sword, uh, the positive and, and beneficial role that innovation and real-time 3D technology is going to play in the development of healthcare and hospitals in the future. So thanks for you guys for your time. And I hope uh, anyone watching enjoyed the discussion. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be Thank here. You. Thanks, Nick.